Harvard University, and she specializes in health physiology, life history, and reproductive biology, and in radiation in humans. And she's involved in lots of different projects, including work with orangutans, in Borneo, and chimpanzees in Uganda, and humans in Bolivia and Tanzania. And she's been a pioneer in developing non invasive methods for endocrinology and um, health physiology, and we've known lots of researchers to um, learn about sort of within lines of free ranging species in the home, which I appreciate. And she's extremely well published, for the be publications in books and journals, um, on various topics like violence and sexual coercion, and mating strategies, <coughs> education, energetics, and life history. And <coughs> today, Dr. Thompson will compare behavioral and physiological adaptations in great apes and humans to understand unique components of human life history and answer questions such as why we're so fertile. So, her talk today is entitled Chimpanzees and the Evolution of Human Life History. Please help me welcome Dr. Melissa Emerson. species 
but also highlight some of the unique features that humans have, uh, which include a greatly extended juvenile dependency, uh, an overall much longer lifespan than we predict for a, a, an organism of our size. And this includes, for women, a substantial post-reproductive period. And so, in fact, the uh, reproductive period between humans and chimpanzees uh, doesn't look that much different. <clears throat> Now these structures of life history have processes underlying them, and they can be understood within a, a fairly basic life history framework. Uh, and the simple rule here is that energy for organisms living in natural environments is limited, and it has to be divided between various processes uh, in a way that ultimately leads to reproductive success. Um, so organisms that want to invest heavily in producing babies have to do so <coughs> at the expense of uh, survival enhancing activities, things like fat storage, immune function, um, and uh, cellular repair. And the reverse is also true. Organisms that want to live for a long time generally have to do so at the expense of reproducing for, uh, frequently. <coughs> um, and so these these kinds of decisions about how to allocate energy, there are, there are species kind of properties of, of how energy is allocated, as well as individual variation of how that's allocated. So here I just have a comparison of uh, various primate species, uh, so you can see some of the variation in reproductive properties. <coughs> and so we go from some very small species, like the lemurs, the lorises, some of the neotropical primates are also quite small, up to large primates like the great apes and humans. And as we go up in size, a lot of features of reproduction change. You're producing a larger offspring that has to get to an even larger size. And for apes and humans in particular, you've got an additional cost associated with producing a disproportionately large brain. And because apes are already big animals, they already have huge energy budgets. Uh, so amassing the little bit of extra energy it needs uh, to care for an infant to build a baby uh, is really quite <coughs> a, a costly expense. So one of the things that we tend to see, <coughs> excuse me, I'll get over this. <coughs> one of the things that we tend to see um, as uh, primates get larger is that the reproductive period extends uh, disproportionately. You see longer gestation lengths, longer lactation periods, accompanied by a slower uh, grow infant growth. And, and what this basically is, is a strategy for, for the mother to invest less, proportionately less of her daily energy budget towards that infant at the expense of taking longer. Um, and humans clearly buck the trend here when it comes to their period of lactation and their birth interval. Uh, whereas uh, chimpanzees have birth intervals of around five to six years in the wild. Humans in hunter-gatherer populations are able to reproduce about every three to four years, despite producing uh, uh, more expensive infants. Uh, so I'm not going to pretend that this is, is a particular puzzle. We have lots of good ideas about how humans have managed to accomplish this uh, by gaining more energy from their environments and by sharing the burden of infant care. <coughs> but I want to point out that this is actually kind of a puzzle because uh, when we look at the reproductive biology, of humans, we see an, an extraordinarily conservative approach towards conceiving infants. Uh, humans are one of the rare species that experiences way more non-conceptive cycles than conceptive cycles. So whereas the lemurs we saw on the previous slide may ovulate once per year, they may only uh, mate for one day out of the year in some cases, uh, and they conceive darting every, every time, humans and populations around the world take on average several months uh, in, in order to conceive. Uh, so this is a, a highly conservative pattern, and it's one that uh, reproductive ecologists like Peter Ellison and his uh, students and colleagues have uh, attributed primarily to management of energy, consistent with that life history framework. Uh, and they have found through a variety of naturalistic and experimental studies uh, that women are highly sensitive to their current energetic condition. In particular, energy balance, which means gaining or losing weight, or energy expenditure when you have to use a high amount of calories during your daily activities. <coughs> and then they've studied this quite extensively using uh, ovarian hormone 
measurements. And so they could look at the production of estrogen and progesterone during the course of women's cycles and how that responds to different energetic conditions. So for example, here, you have a study showing that women who lost a moderate amount of weight produced less progesterone during their cycles than control women. Uh, and this would then result in a reduced ability for a fetus to actually implant into the endometrium. So the nice thing about these studies, uh, one uh, additional thing is that this, uh, Peter Allison has actually put this into a nice adaptive framework. And, and the idea is that uh, these kinds of energetic signals are, are signaling the, the ability to actually carry through an energetic, or sorry, an energetically costly reproductive effort. And, and if a woman is losing weight, she's unlikely to be able to properly uh, gestate and lactate an infant. So it's better to bank that energy and use it in a future time. And the nice thing about this large body of work uh, from human reproductive ecologists is that it provides a really good model on which to compare other species. And the problem is that we really lack a lot of this detailed data on other primate species. Uh, so I think we can go from these kind of gross life history structure comparisons and really better understand uh, the evolution of human life histories by A, getting better data on these other species, um, exploring the variation in life history patterns within species, as has been done for humans, uh, and try to understand the processes that are actually going on at these different life history transitions, and the processes that underlie the variation in life histories. So these are kind of guiding principles for my research. Let's establish what foundation uh, on which the human life history has evolved from. What, what do ape life histories really look like in the wild? Uh, what processes drive variation in life history patterns? Uh, and are these processes actually derived in humans? Or do we use basically the same uh, energetic allocation strategies, the same life history strategies, but just in a vastly different context? Uh, so as anthropologists, we're often pointing to similarities between humans and chimpanzees. Uh, and there's certainly some of these, like the very large body size, the complex diet, uh, and the extended period of offspring dependency, that we might expect to drive these two species towards similar reproductive adaptations. On the other hand, these, uh, this reproduction is placed in a really different context. Uh, so for chimpanzees, so the species is highly promiscuous. Uh, for any given birth, a female mates hundreds of times, uh, and usually with all the males in her group, or almost all of them. Uh, the males provide essentially no paternal care, uh, and really there's little provisioning of any kind in a wild chimpanzee community. Uh, whereas a mother will, of course, breastfeed her offspring, uh, she rarely uh, provides any direct provision for her offspring outside of that context. Um, so our challenge here is in gaining the kind of detailed data that has been uh, as we got for humans from wild primates. Uh, of course, for humans, you can ask them to collect samples for you. You can weigh them as often as you like. You can even change their exercise regimes or their diets. Um, and we could do some of these things for captive primates, uh, but then we'd be missing all, all, all the good stuff, <laughs> all the stuff about you know, fluctuations in energy in their environment, the amount of energy it costs them to gain their daily uh, calorie needs, uh, things like living in a large social group, which create food competition. Um, and so uh, we really need to study this in the wild. And here we have the problem of an organism that lives in very large home ranges, uh, in flexible social groups, so it's difficult to find them. Uh, females are less gregarious than males, so they're even harder to find. Um, and once you find them, you need to be able to obtain biological samples without actually interfering with their activities or causing them distress. And uh, in order to study female reproduction in a species that reproduces so slowly, if you want to get information from one birth to the next, it requires many years of study. Uh, so I've been fortunate enough to work with a project that has sort of embraced this challenge in getting long-term integrated data on the behavior of a community of chimpanzees, as well as getting biological samples in the form of urine uh, from these uh, chimpanzees on uh, as basically as often as, as possible. So this Cabela Chimpanzee Project was established by Richard Rangham of Harvard University uh, in 1987. It's currently uh, co-directed by Martin Muller of UNM. And it's located here in southwestern Uganda in the Kibali Forest. <clears throat> and as a part of daily 
data collection, uh, the field assistants not only collect basic data on the food availability, social behavior, etc., but they collect every urine sample that they can. Uh, and so since uh, 2000, I've been involved with this project, and after doing some field work, I've been chiefly responsible for managing the, the large collection of physiological samples uh, and, and managing the analysis of these samples. So right now we have over 25,000 urine samples collected from 90, uh, over 90 chimpanzees. Uh, and most of my time these days is spent not in the field, but in the laboratory, uh, doing a variety of biomarker analyses. These are not all things we can do in chimpanzees, many of these are things that we do with our collaborators uh, who are studying humans. Uh, but my lab specializes in getting uh, physiological information from non-invasive media. So for uh, humans, this often means saliva, or for primates, this might mean feces or urine. Um, <clears throat> and all these things, some of these are going to be uh, byproducts of uh, cellular processes in the body. But a lot of them are actually signals that the body sends uh, to the brain, back and forth. Uh, that, are, that are used to regulate these kinds of life history processes that we're interested in. Um, so steroid hormones in particular uh, are, uh, are allocating energy towards different processes like reproduction or stress response or metabolism and so forth. <coughs> so we're basically trying to tap into these signals. Uh, so at this point, usually there's a few people wondering how it is that we managed to collect these, these urine samples from chimpanzees at such a high rate. Uh, and this, it's really not that difficult because they're arboreal, so we can stand underneath them and hope that something falls. Uh, so as long as we can identify the individual in the tree that's urinating, uh, we just need to collect a very small amount in order to do one mil of urine uh, will allow us to do a, really a lot of different kinds of analyses. Um, and this cartoon I like because this is the headline that appeared next to it. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about a bunch of different studies that try to, to look at fertility. First looking at uh, the interaction of, of energy with conceptive ability. Uh, second looking at the period of lactational amenorrhea, which is the time from a birth of an infant to the time when the mother starts cycling again. And then uh, I'll, I'll look at uh, menopause and, and talk about how that uh, regulates fertility. So the first thing to note is that the physiology, the mechanisms that uh, govern ovulation and conception are remarkably similar in chimpanzees and in humans. Uh, and uh, what we've got here are just the, the patterns of estrogen and progesterone during the menstrual cycle. There's nothing special you need to know about these, except that if you're not connoisseurs of uh, menstrual cycles, these two, these similarities between these two cycles are actually quite remarkable because these, these hormonal patterns vary quite tremendously across uh, mammals and even across primates. So uh, apes and humans share some particular characteristics. But individual cycles don't look like that. Most of them uh, are messy like this. And so there are some cycles which feature really nice peaks in the hormones and others which show not much going on. Um, and uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, human reproductive ecologists have really tried to dissect uh, this variation and have attributed much of it to uh, variation in energy. So this is the same study that you saw before, again showing that, that weight loss uh, leads to reduction in progesterone production. Uh, curiously, you can see in this particular graph that the cycle after women lost weight also featured a deficit in production uh, of uh, progesterone. So we've been able to show very similar things with our chimpanzees, looking at natural variation in food availability. And what you have here are uh, hormone levels, estrogen and progesterone levels for females uh, before, during, and after periods of fruit abundance. So we get a, a nice spike in, in hormone production during the fruit abundance. <coughs> and you can see uh, the reverse effect during fruit storage. Uh, and in this graph, we have estrogen levels for individual females. So you can see all the individuals responding in much the same way to this uh, change in the environment. And like the human study, you see a kind of a lag. Even after the fruit shortage is over, I think the recovery uh, females show uh, still uh, an effect on their reproductive function. And this really matters as far as their conception rates. Um, here, again, we have a study of humans here showing estrogen profiles in women who conceived on the top versus women who didn't conceive. Uh, so higher estrogen production really matters. Uh, we found the same for our chimpanzees, both estrogens and progesterones 
are higher in uh, conception cycles versus non-conception cycles. Um, and in this case, we actually had one female who conceived with really low levels uh, of hormone production, but she lost her fetus. So this actually produces pretty strong effects on life history uh, because it delays the waiting time to conception. Uh, and if we look at uh, ripe fruit proportion of the diet, which is a pretty good measure of diet quality in wild chimpanzees, we find that females who are cycling during periods of below average uh, fruit availability uh, tend to uh, take much longer to conceive than females who uh, cycle during good periods. And this can amount to more than a year of delay for some females. We can also see the same pattern reflected in inter-individual differences. Uh, so in our community at, at Q Valley, we have quite a large home range, over 30 square kilometers, uh, and females tend to not want to range that far, so they stick to smaller core areas within uh, the home range. Uh, we have a group of females who like to, to be in the central to the southern part of the home range, and another group who hang out in the north. And this shows you our whole home range and the distribution of the preferred fruit trees uh, in, within that home range. So the center to the south has the greatest concentration of, of good food available, whereas the females in the north are here where there's not a whole lot to eat. And uh, we can see uh, the correlation of that in their reproductive function. The females living in that high quality area, uh, no matter what reproductive stage they're in, produce higher levels of both estrogen and progesterone. Uh, their infants are also far more likely to uh, survive to reach maturity, and their reproductive rates are much higher. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, uh, females, when they come into a new community and try to gain access to either this area or this area, they fight pretty intensely with the resident females over, over access to these areas. Uh, and in some communities, there have been uh, females killing other females' infants. Uh, in looking to be this kind of territorial uh, dispute. So taking these results together, it suggests that, that chimpanzees really share with humans this very highly conservative approach uh, to allocating energy towards conception. Um, that's maybe not surprising, because it turns out that the waiting time to conception for both these species is pretty similar. So this is not where the meat of the fertility difference between species is really to be had. Uh, so a better place to look then will be in the period of lactational amenorrhea uh, because lactation is really the costliest part of the reproductive cycle uh, and it takes uh, a lot of time. Um, so and it's also the most variable within both species. So let's look at what's going on there. So fortunately there is a, a good model for humans uh, of this process. Uh, and um, you know it was originally thought, I think most people still believe that the act of suckling an infant is what suppresses ovulation and what regulates the birth interval. Um, and, and recently it's become clear uh, from a, a variety of evidence uh, that this isn't true. It's clear that women in traditional populations around the world conceive while they're still nursing their previous infants. Um, and, and women who are in relatively good condition, like this Toba woman in Argentina, are able to maintain really short birth intervals despite a very intense lactation regime. So these are, these are former hunter-gatherers. They're now settled. They're sedentary. They have a lot of fatty food available. Uh, but they maintain a lot of the practices from when they were hunter-gatherers. So they basically breastfeed like a, a Kung San woman would. Um, and yet they have quite short birth intervals. Uh, so Claudia Valeggia has studied the toba, and she proposed a new mechanism uh, she calls the metabolic load hypothesis. Uh, and the idea here is it's not the act of suckling that suppresses fertility in lactating women, it's the cost of producing the milk relative to the mother's own energy budget. So a mother in really good condition like this toba woman can afford to produce the milk for her infant without taking much of a hit to her own body. Whereas an undernourished woman uh, would really have to struggle to, to to provide that food to her infant uh, and would subsequently take longer to recover. Uh, Valencia used a, a relatively new tool in anthropology uh, called C-peptide of insulin. And what the C-peptide is, is this yellow bit. This is the whole pro-insulin molecule. Uh, and when, it's, when insulin is actually secreted from the pancreas, the C-peptide gets popped off and eventually is secreted into the urine. So, we can non-invasively measure the production 
of insulin in this manner. And that's exciting because insulin is one of the body's key signals and regulators of energy balance. Uh, it's also really important for allocating energy during the processes of gestation and lactation. It's what really uh, manages energy for mom versus energy to the baby. And it's exciting for me because this provides a, a mechanism, uh, or sorry, a, a method by which we can look at energetic condition in wild primates without weighing them, which is really difficult. Uh, so my colleagues and I were some of the first to actually go out and, and test this method in uh, wild apes. So here is, is what uh, Claudia Valeggia found in Rotova women. Uh, what we're looking at are changes in body mass and C peptide, uh, looking from the time of cycle resumption backward. Uh, so at the beginning of lactation, women uh, experience weight loss associated with the intense breastfeeding, and their C peptide levels are accordingly quite low. But as uh, the time of cycling approaches, you see that women reach uh, a neutral and then a positive energy balance, meaning they're taking in more than they're expending, they're gaining weight. And the C-peptide levels uh, are correlated with that, they're increasing, and, and you actually get this period of overshooting where the, the insulin production is higher uh, than the baseline for non-pregnant, non-lactating women. Uh, and their explanation for this is that the ovaries have become so insulin resistant that you need a kind of a big a jump start here in order to get cycling going. So uh, I was able to, to look at the same process in chimpanzees. Uh, it took about 12 years of data on uh, lactating female chimpanzees and around 3,000 urine samples. Uh, but we basically have compiled uh, a, a chart that looks very similar to what the Legia produced. So again, you have cycling here at the blue line and then going backward in time. And you can see the same pattern of increase from a negative uh, energy balance to a positive energy balance. And you also see this overshooting period and that's very similar to what occurred in the toba. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, you might just sort of think uh, this is obvious that when they start lactating they just experience a steady increase in their energy balance over the course of lactation and that's definitely not the case. We've lined all these up but some females are able to achieve this pattern in only about two years uh, and those females start cycling uh, at two years. In fact, the, the shortest birth interval we've had in the well is, is about two years. <clears throat> Some females take six years or longer in order to attain this pattern. What you see is that they tend to fluctuate back and forth around neutral to, ener to uh, negative energy balance and then over time slowly achieve uh, this level. So the suggestion here is really that it's the long period of trying to recover uh, that uh, positive energy balance that's limiting the, the reproductive rates in, in chimpanzees. But we've also, we're able to find that the C-peptide levels positively predicted both their production of estrogen and progesterone, so again this suggests that, that it's energy balance that's uh, regulating reproductive function. And we see the uh, compatible differences in when we look at our two groups of females. The females in the relatively poor area, the northern females here, uh, had lower C-peptide levels during early lactation, suggesting that this was a harder hit on their systems than for the females who were in the high quality areas. And so here's just those two profiles of the toba and the chimpanzees lined up, so that you can see the, the overall similarities between them. Uh, and here I've lined up the x-axis so you can see the difference between them. And the difference is just that chimpanzees experience a much less steep rise in, in their energy balance, um, and, they, and again, it just suggests that they're taking much, much longer to recover. Now, we have a variety of behavioral evidence, uh, and as well as the C peptide evidence that suggests that uh, really for only about two years are females um, investing intensely in milk production. Um, and after that, it's, it's not having a, a strong effect on them, and so again, we think it's, it's just their ability to, to recover from these costs. So our data support the human data, these are the only two data sets I'm aware of of this kind, suggest that fecundity is, is limited not by nursing itself, but by the ability to recover a positive energy balance. Uh, but along with the other data I show you, this again suggests that the mechanisms that are governing inner birth intervals in humans and chimpanzees are very, very similar um, and quite different from what we see in some other species. And this suggests to me that most of the difference here is not in our 
reproductive adaptations, but in the test, uh, which includes increased energy access for humans. Uh, and so, of course, humans in, in many societies are able to gain extra calories by eating lots of meat uh, and by cooking food, which increases the calories available from that food. It also increases the digestibility of that food, the palatability, particularly for young ones. And across human societies, we see paternal provisioning, which is helping to subsidize the costs of caring for a dependent infant. But we also see uh, other kinds of food sharing between other uh, community members. And it's also important to recognize that food flows not just to infants, but it flows to the mother herself. So even during the period when she's exclusively breastfeeding that kid, uh, her, uh, that, that cost is being subsidized by other individuals in the group. Uh, and so a variety of studies have shown that having helping kin members and humans helps to improve reproductive rates. It also often helps uh, improve health uh, and survival of those kids. And as we've seen in, chim uh, in chimpanzees, this kind of provisioning just doesn't happen. Uh, and in fact, in chimpanzees, males are, are more of a hindrance. Uh, so we recently found that when we look at our C-peptide levels according to grouping patterns, we find that females uh, are experiencing lower energy balance when they're in larger groups, and particularly when they're hanging around with lots of males. And this is enough, this is true of both cycling females and lactating females. And this effect is strong enough to mitigate most good periods of food availability. So there's lots of food, lots of individuals aggregate there, uh, and yet females aren't gaining the kind of benefit that they might otherwise gain because uh, they're competing for resources with males, and males do lots of disruptive things. So we've done other studies to show that female cortisol, or stress hormone levels, are strongly predicted uh, by male aggression, so males are harassing them all the time. So we move now to thinking about menopause briefly. Um, menopause is something that anthropologists have produced lots and lots of theory work on. Um, and it's variably been described as a feature that is unique to humans or as a feature that's shared with many other primate species but is perhaps just enhanced in humans. And there is some uh, captive data that has suggested that chimpanzees experience a premature reproductive senescence, so they're, they're, they're experiencing a long post-reproductive period. And this uh, comparison is really important for the purposes of, of this discussion for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, menopause, of course, defines the end to your fertile period, so if chimpanzees also have a menopause, that will, of course, limit their fertility. Uh, but another reason is that most of the adaptive hypotheses for the evolution of post-reproduction in humans rely on some kind of provisioning from the grand parental generation uh, to the young ones. And since that kind of provisioning doesn't occur in chimpanzees, uh, if, if chimpanzees share a feature of menopause, it would suggest that those hypotheses are, are not valid. And I want to point out that, that the defining feature of menopause uh, is not that the reproductive system ages. That's entirely to be expected. Uh, what's different here is that the reproductive system ages at such a more rapid rate than any other bodily system. So here we see uh, steep declines in fertility uh, at an age when other systems like uh, cardiac capacity are, are really running at full function. So in order to look at this uh, and try to understand age-related patterns of fertility in chimpanzees, uh, we collaborated with uh, most of the existing uh, field sites for uh, chimpanzee research. So this comprises probably the majority of um, individually recognized females in the wild. Uh, and what you see here are uh, the production of offspring per female per year for different age groups. The red curve is your chimpanzee line, and we've compared it here to the Ache, who are a group of hunter-gatherers in Paraguay. Uh, who have, just happen to have really good demographic data. And what you can see is that chimpanzees start reproducing earlier. Uh, most chimpanzees have their first birth by about age 14. They have, don't reach the peaks in fertility that humans do. This is the reasons we've already discussed, that humans are maintaining a much shorter birth interval. Um, but what we see is a really striking overlap in the pattern of reproductive decline uh, in the 40s. So this might lead some people to conclude that, yes, humans and chimpanzees do share a feature of menopause. 
Um, but that's not the correct interpretation for a really important reason. Uh, here, again, is the same fertility curve that you saw in red, uh, and it's matched up with the survivorship curve. And what the, the survivorship curve, the dashed line shows you, uh, are the proportion of females who were ever born who are still alive at the end of each of these age groups. And so for chimpanzees, the main take home point of the slide is that our reproductive rates are quite high at an age when very, very few chimpanzees are still living. Very few chimps live to their fullest. Uh, and so you see survivorship and fertility reaching zero at basically the same time. This is entirely what you'd expect if the reproductive system is just aging along with everything else and, and there's no premature reproductive senescence at all. And we can see the contrast when we look at humans where reproduction declines to zero at an age where even in a very marginal population, 40% of women are expected to still be alive. And so this difference between uh, fertility and survivorship comprises the post-reproductive period that many, many women experience. We've also been able to go back in our chimp data and look at females uh, who, uh, <clears throat> who are relatively healthy and relatively unhealthy, which we just defined by whether they died soon or not, uh, and found that females who were uh, in the relatively healthy group maintained high reproductive rates quite late in life. And, and unhealthy females, even when they were in their 20s, didn't reproduce as well. Uh, whereas in humans, fertility will stop even if you're in very, very good health. Uh, so our data suggests uh, that uh, post-reproductive lifespan really is a uniquely human trait, at least among primates. There are some whales that do this as well. Um, it also shows us that because of earlier reproduction and, and this sort of same endpoint, that chimpanzees actually have more reproductive years to spend if they could consistently live long enough. Uh, and so it really here it's the mortality pattern that's driving lifetime fertility uh, as much as, as the birth rate. Just want to spend a couple minutes talking about some future directions for our research team. I've talked almost entirely about this fertile period uh, of the lifespan, but we're now, now that we have a growing data set and more and more methodologies, we want to start looking at development of infants and at the aging process. Uh, and and um, I won't go into that in too much detail. I just want to show you some of the fancy new methods that we're using because they're, they're really cool. Um, we're using now a parallel laser photography in order to get body size estimates of, of our chimpanzees. I was really skeptical of how well this would work. Uh, the error, uh, the, the error in measurements that we're getting in the field are incredibly tiny. We're even able to look at things like testes size using this method. Um, and uh, we've also been able to use digital photography to look at dental development. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw this paper by Tanya Smith from Harvard where uh, she was able to use our photographs to look at molar eruption without ever having to capture a chimpanzee. Um, coming from the biomarker point of view, I've recently been able to adapt uh, a method that's commonly used in clinics uh, in Western settings to try to evaluate muscle mass, which uses creatinine. And if you go to a clinic and they want to measure your muscle mass, they'll ask you to collect all your urine for 24 hours. They'll measure creatinine and they can scale it. Uh, we can't collect urine for 24 hours from our chimpanzees, but we're able to take sets of samples and actually do the same thing uh, by using uh, a, sort of a separate index. And I just want to show you that these are our preliminary uh, results. Uh, we can actually pick up growth curves. You know, this is growth of skeletal muscle. Uh, we can now see uh, in uh, early adulthood the sexual dimorphism and growth in muscle mass between male chimpanzees and female chimpanzees. And although we have relatively few older individuals so far, uh, you can start to see a decline in muscle mass, which in, in humans is really one of the driving features uh, behind the aging process, is, is the loss of, of muscle. Uh, when it comes to the aging process, we know almost nothing about how humans compare to other age species. Um, and most of it looks like this. It's just mortality uh, comparisons. Uh, so this came from a paper in 2001 uh, comparing chimpanzee mortality rates to humans. Um, in fact, our chimpanzee community has mortality rates that look far more like humans uh, because they don't have 
a lot of hunting pressure, and they haven't experienced disease outbreaks. Now, what's interesting, what, even when we look at this, is that clearly the mortality uh, risk isn't um, linear. Uh, that both species are able to maintain relatively low rates of mortality during early adulthood. But something really extraordinary happens here, uh, where chimpanzees in their 40s just die off really rapidly, whereas humans are able to slow this process much longer. Um, we don't even know what kills wild chimpanzees in most cases, especially the older ones. Um, and we don't know if it's the same processes that are occurring in humans. Uh, so we're going to be doing a lot of different kinds of health analyses in order to try and understand this process. Uh, one, of the, one of the methods involves using oxidative stress. This is something that I've worked with with my human, uh, human colleagues, <laughs> my colleagues studying humans. Um, oxidative stress is uh, the result of uh, damage that occurs during cellular processes. Um, and it can be uh, documented in, in, in several ways, but one is by uh, a marker of DNA damage. Um, and we've just been able to do a really preliminary study with chimps. This is really expensive, so we just did one sample per chip. Um, uh, but in humans, oxidative stress tends to accumulate with age uh, because you that you can repair the damage, but that's at the expense of other life history processes. If you want to reproduce, you might have to cut back on, on, on repairing your cells. Um, so over time, that stress tends to accumulate. You see higher levels of oxidative stress in individuals who have had uh, chronic uh, stress, who have been exposed to toxins or have had um, uh, childhood diseases and that kind of thing. So in our chimpanzees, we saw for females, at least tentatively, the kind of increase that you might expect with age. Uh, what was curious was what we saw, at least in some males, uh, is our really high levels in early adulthood. And if this pattern uh, holds with more data, it's really exciting, because this is the time when adult males are really investing in things like muscle mass and in competing for dominance rank. Um, and, and this is expected to actually be the most costly part of their uh, lifetime. Uh, so overall today, I hope I've been able to show you that while we know a whole lot about human life history patterns and the biology that underlies them, uh, we can gain a much uh, better perspective on our evolutionary ideas by actually getting good data on closely related species. Uh, one thing we can do is to uh, determine which features are derived and which are shared with other apes. Uh, the influence of physiological adaptations, like the ones I've talked about today, versus the behavioral adaptations like provisioning, uh, cooking. And eventually this allows us to help uh, evaluate the viability of all these hypotheses that are, that are out there. Um, and in this particular case, the closer study of these processes has helped to, uh, to reveal some of the surprising similarities and differences between species. Uh, so when we looked at fertility, we saw this huge apparent difference, and yet the underlying biology is very, very similar. Um, and when we looked at menopause, we saw an apparently similar pattern, uh, which really is functionally much different. And so I want to thank you for, for your patience and uh, all my various collaborators for this work. And I'd love to ask you questions. You have to talk loud because I can't hear it.
responsible for the aging process. It's either um, a direct reflection of the processes of aging, or it's actively involved in, in uh, the breakdown of systems. Yeah. Have people collected data on C peptide and group size and composition in hunter gatherers? And not that I'm aware of. Uh, Are you? I'm not aware of it either, but no, yeah, it'd okay. be interesting to see if it was if there was if you had a linear trend that was flipped or if it was nonlinear in some way or something. Like that. As far as I know, uh, Valencia study is really the only one that's been done in humans. Uh, the reason probably because you can weigh people. <laughs> Um, and so that's probably an easier way to get at it. Um, but I'm not even aware of, of that kind of weight data on, on, on humans and group size. It would be, be nice to, to know. Um, this is something we're looking at in, in various ways in orangutans because, of course, they're so averse to, to grouping um, that we'd expect that when they, they, they do group up, there may be some interesting stuff going on. Um, and preliminarily, some of the results that we're getting on orangutans are really weird. So. Um, we just look at uh, amount of uh, energy available per hectare, um, we find that there's a nice relationship with C-peptide, like you'd expect, up to a point. And then all of a sudden, at least for males, at the highest fruit availability, they're experiencing really low energy balance. They have no idea why. They're doing something. Uh, in one of your early slides, you showed different reproductive rates for chimpanzees in different habitat locations. And I remember the Thai forest ones had particularly low rates, it looked like. I think one of them was low, one of them was high. <laughs> yeah, because my, well, my, my, my question really, yeah, Busu might have been Thai. higher, was higher than Thai, if I recall correctly. But my question is, um, I remember that um, you have uh, more male-female associations in Thai because of the high leopard predation mm -hmm. rates there. I don't know if that's still the case, but certainly it's been published. Yeah. And which would, would, do you see that as the link basically there then? Or, or, or is yeah. it, would it be interacting with, you know, food quality or availability? I don't know a lot about the quality of food available at Thai. Mm -hmm. I think it probably differs between the different study sites, but I think that's a, that's a really interesting idea, if they're forced to maintain higher groups, then that may be responsible. They, you know, there are some, there's some other strange things. Some of the, the results from Thai suggest that they transition between lactation and uh, cycling earlier, and they just end up cycling for much, much longer um, than East African chimpanzees. Um, and then we don't have them progress for when it is. So the intervirth intervals aren't that much different, but that transition point has moved almost to the Bonobo. Kind of. Have you started thinking about or <clears throat> investigating the allocation of resources for these females that are in these stressed conditions? Sex differences in allocation? So when you look at their, so their reproductive rate is lower, their survival of kids is lower, is there a difference between sons and daughters' survival? And um, with the, you know, they don't reproduce often enough for us to know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has been That's true. the real challenge is, is that, the, you know, some of these females had birth intervals of nine or ten years. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have a difficult time doing anything uh, compared with, with their kids. Uh, but that's certainly something we're thinking about in our development project. And one of my key interests in that project is to understand the influence of maternal energy on the development of, of the infants. Um, and not only using those kind of lactation C-peptide data, we can take that and look. Now it's, it's five years. We can look at those kids and see how, how they've developed, uh, but also using those neighborhood, using rank uh, as well. And we'll be looking at aspects of social development, things like distance from the mother, how often they play, what kind of a role they take in play, uh, as well as the morphological development. Yeah, because I think I think it was the orangutan data where they did the C peptides and showed that the the the, the, um, the energetic status of the mom during the development actually affected whether they would turn out to be Peter Pan males versus full fled, flanged males. I've seen that. Yeah, we just saw that. It was presented at IPS. Yeah, presented at IPS. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cheryl Nott, I think, presented that. I think it was an author on the paper. I, I think you were too. <laughs> 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 no, actually, in that case, I think it was the males that, that we were looking at the, at the adult males and then their, their actual condition. Yeah. Mm. We get one in the back. Of the oh, so I believe.
about 400,000 eggs are produced by human and female during fetal development, and only about 480 on average are going to be equally for reproduction. So I think it would be kind of interesting to know how many, how much energy is allocated to how many eggs that are produced in a female chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. So it's actually more like 70 million okay. regimens, and then by the time they're born, most of them are gone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, we don't. Uh, there has been one really nice study recently uh, of, of menopause looking at uh, eggs in, in uh, chimpanzees that died naturally in, in zoos and other kinds of facilities, uh, and they took sections and, and were able to count you know, the number of follicles that are left and compare that to humans, and it looks, their data very much supports the data that I have from the wild and suggesting that there are, those females are, are still reproductive when they're quite old. But as far as the amount of energy it takes to produce that many eggs or how many they start off with, we can know yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, you presented this data uh, showing that human and chimpanzee uh, female reproductive biology is quite similar in terms of its regulation by energetic conditions. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that that was different from what we see in other species. I'm wondering if there are other what do you mean and how is it different? Okay. It's not energetic conditions in all primates. Um, so, you know, primates are, are interesting because they're so varied. And they go from species that uh, reliably reproduce every time they have an opportunity. Um, and, and the flip side of that is they have incredibly high rates of infant mortality. That was the case we did. Sometimes 70 something percent um, in so many more species. Uh, and, and so there seems to be. The filter is not on conception, but on, um, on infant survivorship. And then they tend to give birth in a period when there's lots of food available. And that makes sense if you've got a small kid that's can grow up really rapidly, uh, because they can take advantage of one big boom of food um, and, and have a good chance of making it. If that boom doesn't come, it's true. But um, humans and apes, and probably some of the other large primate species, uh, show a much different pattern where there, there's a more of a filter on conception, and, and this is where we start to see uh, there are, are relatively few species, baboons, muriki, uh, and the apes that, that we know uh, often cycle repeatedly before uh, conceiving. And then there, the flip side of that is that their infants seem to have a much higher probability of surviving. Uh, so in, in other mammals, you would see this kind of contrast being an income breeding, capital breeding. So, uh, you know, lemurs are relying on the income when they produce the baby, um, and uh, apes are relying on, on, um, on having the capital up front. Uh, it's not really true. <laughs> in fact, we find if you look at primates that most primates are income breeders in terms of when they time their babies, but most primates are capital breeders in the sense that they are sensitive to, to energy availability. So even in a lemur, if they're in, in really poor condition, they just skip a, skip a breeding season, something like that. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a different pattern that really doesn't have, to my knowledge, a correlate. OK, I have one more. It's OK. <laughs> um, we've been talking about this in our little evolutionary development a little discussion group about this this mystery of why humans, despite the fact that they can get down to really starvation levels and continue yeah. to cycle, yeah. do you see that in other primates? And what what no. what? Yeah, what <laughs> what's way. your ideas on that? Um, well, um, so in chimpanzees, we certainly see a lot of gaps when the food is not available; they'll stop cycling and pick up again. And we have the endocrine data. We know they didn't conceive and lose it. They, they, they just stopped doing it. Um, and that certainly happens in humans. But but you're right that they seem to tolerate a much uh, tolerate a lot of energetic stress and still cycle. Uh, but the, the kind of work that Peter Olson's done has really shown that a lot of those cycles are, are pretty poor. They have a pretty low likelihood of conception. Uh, so even a, a cycle that uh, has menstruation, which would be normally how we gauge that kind of thing. Um, may have a really low likelihood of ovulation happening uh, or, or of there being an adequate uh, endometrial lining for implantation to occur. Uh, these reproductive hormones even affect the, the ability of the ova to be fertilized. 
so there's a huge amount of variation that we just can't see uh, without actually looking at the, at the hormonal profiles. Oh, that's interesting. Which you know, explains adolescent females as well, you know, cycle repeatedly, but they, believe it or not, teenagers have a really low likelihood of getting pregnant on any particular cycle. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they seem 